I didn't know where I was going. All my racing had gone. I had some disposable income and I thought that that was my saviour. So Nick, welcome to Audible. Hi. We're here to talk about your brand new book, which is very exciting. <laughs> I'm going to go in deep straight away because there Absolutely. is so much I Please wanted do. to cover. So quite near the start of the book, you said that you felt quite isolated and alone from mm -hmm. a really, really young age. Yep. So why was that? I felt like I was like born into the world on the, on the back foot. Um, you know, I, I wasn't breathing when I was initially born. I was whisked away into an incubator. My parents were, were given the diagnosis and I was they were pretty much left to their own devices. Um, you know, and, and, and so I, I went into this world, which is basically an able-bodied world. Um, you know, it's not designed for, for disabled people like me. My parents uh, decided to, to put me in schools um, full of able-bodied people. I wasn't in a special school or a school for disabled people. Um, so I stuck out like a sore thumb. I was the, the only person of colour um, at school, the only disabled person. Um, and up until the age of eight, I hadn't seen another disabled person. So I, I pretty much felt like I was the only disabled person in the world at that point. Mm. So tell me a bit about how cerebral palsy affects you and your body. It's uh, spastic diplegia, which is a, a form of cerebral palsy, and obviously cerebral palsy affects so many different people in so many different ways. <clears throat> you know, you've got hemiplegia, which is which is down one side, diplegia, which is which is two limbs like myself, um, and it can, you know it can get serious as not being able to to feed yourself, being constantly reliant on a wheelchair or a helper. So I, I sort of class myself as one of the lucky ones now, at least. Um, but really, it's just um, super tight um, muscles. Um, spasticity and tightness in the muscles, um, which means that balance, you know, walking up and down stairs is really, really difficult. Every time I try and take a step or a movement, it's almost like someone's trying to push it back in the opposite direction. You know, mm -hmm. it's almost like you've you've got someone trying to make it difficult for you to make a move. Um, <clears throat> but it's like a domino effect. So once you start trying to walk, it affects your skeleton in different ways, you know, because everything has to try and compensate for the movement, so then that affects um, the spine. So I've got scoliosis in the spine, and I pop ribs, and my pelvis, you know, is super tight. And so it just it just compounds. Yeah. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, you can't have the disability take over your life. Um, you've got to grab it by the scruff of the neck if you can, um, and try and do the best best you can with it. And you know, that's how I've lived my life so far. And um, yeah, it's not been easy, but it's a, a powerful journey. Mm. And there was a time in high school when you started using a wheelchair because the school was much bigger and yeah. getting to lessons and things. So what was that like, that moment in terms of how you felt included or really not included? So it was a, it was a big decision because obviously I just wanted to fit in and, and be, you know, one of the lads and, and, um, and not be, be seen as someone different I always wanted it to be as, as normal as normal as, as possible and I think to start with um, you know it was a novelty because um, other children or kids hadn't seen another kid in a wheelchair before so wheelchairs were new to them and so they saw saw me as quite cool to start with it was like oh my god Nick's in a wheelchair you know can I push him can we go here can we go there can I go to you know, break early or lunchtime early or whatever. So it was a novelty to start with. And so I, I instantly felt, okay, this this sort of put me in a position where people sort of understood that I was different. They were okay with the difference. And yes, it helped physically for me where I didn't have to walk. Um, but I think it took its toll as time got on. And yeah, by the time I got to 15, the novelty wore off and, you know, I just got bullied from there. Mm. And you say that you never talk to your parents about <clears throat> bullying. Mm. Why did you never speak to them about it? <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I I've grown up in a uh, you know in a household that you know we have so much going on. We have so much going on with Lewis and his career, and we're all focused on on him and going to races every weekend. And um, and and I've always been a person to never put my baggage on people. Mm. Um, a, because I didn't want my mum to worry. Mm. My mum, you know, has that motherly instinct. As soon as I said that I was being bullied, I, I didn't want her to, to lay awake at night and worry about it. Um, she already has to worry enough about me in general. But then I also didn't want her to give me help or advice because 
she's taught me from a very young age to follow my own um, strength and make my own decisions. And so I didn't tell her anything. And I don't agree that that's the right thing to do. Um, that's just what worked for me. And that's the whole point of the book. It's, you know, I, <laughs> I don't know the answers of anything. You know, this is just what worked for me as a disabled person. Um, and maybe you can take a little bit of my advice and it helps. But if it doesn't, then OK. But if it does, then great. Mm. And bullying obviously can have a lasting mm -hmm. effect. Mm -hmm. What do you think the impact of the bullying has been on you? I mean, you said that you're in therapy, so I'd imagine it's something <laughs> you've touched upon. Yeah, um, bullying cuts deep. Um, it can have a long lasting effect from, from, from when you get to, to the age that I am today, like 32, and, and how you feel about yourself, your identity, who you are as a person. Um, if someone's getting bullied, they don't look at the bully themselves, thinking maybe it's the bully that's in, in the wrong. They look at themselves and think, oh, is it me? I'm, uh, I must be ugly, or I must be this, or I must be that, or I must be uncool. And they don't just take it in that moment. They take, like, I'm uncool, I'm ugly. They take that all the way through their life, um, which is pretty much what I did. I got bullied. I felt uncool. So for a long period of time, I looked at myself in the mirror up until, yeah, my early 30s, thinking, I'm uncool I'm un and, and I'm ugly, you know? And, and so what's been really cool is I've been going to therapy and learning more and more and more about myself, literally going home and then writing what I've learned through mm. therapy into the book. And one of those moments was saying, I'm pretty much just a, I feel like a, just an 11 year old in my wheelchair in the dark, um, like I was at school. Um, and that's how I feel even now, you know, and, and that's all come through through bullying. So um, even though I don't carry that with me every single day, I think that's where the core is. So with bullying, it it gets you to the core. Mm. Um, and it's a it's a real long process to to get through it or get past it. Yeah, definitely. Long answer, so. No, not at all. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned um, Lewis before and how busy your family were. Yeah. Because of the focus on him and his racing, what did you see as your role or your place within the family? That's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> well, firstly, look, I, I, I um, you know, I could have been uh, a person that complained being like, hey, why are you not putting any attention on me? You know, what about my life or what about my career or, or anything like that? Um, I never was. I never I never expected any attention. I never wanted to be the star of the show. Um, I am still Lewis's number number one fan and and always want the best for him. And so I felt like my uh, my role was I would say I was the glue. I'm the glue to to the family. I feel like I keep it together. Um, you know, everybody's going off in their own directions, doing different things, and and um, they all circle back to me. Um, and so, you know, when it comes to Lewis, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I feel like I'm I'm the I'm the person that truly, truly, truly has his back and understands him fully, um, as as any brother would. Um, and so. I just wanted it to be a support mechanism for for both my brother and my dad. Um, and I feel like I'm a big support mechanism for my mum as well. So um, That's a lot for one person to take on. I know. <laughs> At the end of the day, just like I, I say in the book and how I feel my purpose is, is I'm here for, for others. I'm here to help other people and support other people. Um, and that's the purpose behind of, of why I've put everything on, you know, on a page and down on paper. And... Alongside kind of writing this book, which I suppose fits into a lot of the stuff you've done around public speaking and kind of motivational mm -hmm. work, you are a racing driver. Yeah. So I want to touch on that a bit. Sure. And tell me what gaming gave you, what doors that opened up? Yeah, I mean, um, gaming was, was everything to me. Um, I, I put all of my passion and desire through motorsport into gaming because I didn't feel like I could ever have a... Um, a real life racing career. First, firstly, it's super expensive. Second, it's very physical, and there was no, um, at the time, there wasn't a physically disabled person 
um, you know, racing the top flight of, of British motorsport. And so it didn't, it just seemed impossible. Um, but it, it opened this door for me to understand the ins and outs of accelerating and braking and racing lines and race craft and car setup and all that sort of stuff and my and and just general technique um so you learn a lot through through gaming and now that was you know quite some time ago you know 2009 you know, it doesn't sound a long time ago but technology has improved so much mm. um you know that you can literally take what you've learned on a game and put it in a in, in a real race car and get in the opportunity to to drive for the first time you know i wasn't even though i'd never driven a car before um the techniques were very similar you know, mm. braking, accelerator, t uh, turning, etc., um, and and that opened an, a whole new opportunity potentially for me to to start something that I thought was completely impossible. Yeah, and in racing now, you have had you've had some really terrifying moments <laughs> and some really big achievements. Yeah. Does that does that balance out for you as a net win? <laughs> that's, a, that's such a good question. Um, <laughs> look, I mean, I've gone from um, being born at four pound four, told that I would pretty much never walk, and if I was going to walk, it'd be with a stick, um, to being bullied at school, being in a wheelchair, struggling for purpose, to to being a racing driver who has um, created history in the sport. Um, achieved more than I could ever wish to achieve in the sport, but not just that. I've inspired thousands and thousands of of, of people, both able-bodied and disabled, through what I've done, um, through my achievements, through my my mentality, my strength, um, and really taking my disability to a new height. Um, if I didn't have that to focus on, I would still be in a wheelchair. I wouldn't be living independently in my own house. Um, I don't know where I would be. Um, and so motorsport, I haven't just achieved something in motorsport, I've completely turned my life upside down at the same time. And with with motorsport, inevitably there's going to be accidents and crashes and, and whatever. Um, so this is 100% a, a win. Um, even if I crashed a million times, um, the fact that I'm in a race car driving, beating and racing against able-bodied people, considering where I was when I was a, an 11 year old kid, didn't think I could have relationships, didn't think people would really give me their attention or care about me um, to, have achieved, to have achieved what I've achieved and you know, put myself in the history books um, is definitely a, definitely a win, yeah. Mm. <laughs> and you also write that you should never, you don't think that people should ever take the easy road. Um, so I'm really curious about this because there's pushing yourself and not taking the easy road yeah. and then there's not giving yourself any self-compassion and you yeah. seem to have some balance Absolutely. of the two which mm -hmm. I think is really difficult yeah. so how have you got to a place where A you think never take the easy road mm -hmm. and B you can balance that with giving yourself compassion and maybe every now and then asking for help if you need it you know, it started out being like, my parents, they didn't help me on purpose. You know, it, it sounds like they're awful, but they they really weren't awful. They were just like, no, Nick, you, you have the strength to do it yourself. Um, and and if I, even if I said to them, yeah, but can I go in this direction instead? They would always be like, well, but you can physically do this direction. So why would you choose this direction instead? You know, why don't you give the, the 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 harder route a go, and work backwards if need be from there, um, and so that's always been ingrained in me. So so I would always take you know the harder route because like it it just always leads to personal growth, even if it's negative. So even if it doesn't work and I fail, I feel like I've grown really well through that failure. Um, so I would rather fail at the hardest route than succeed at the easiest route all the time. Mm. And given you think that failure is so important, you write that in the book. I do. What would you say your biggest failure is? <laughs> That's an amazing question. Ooh. 
You never thought that. So I have two. <clears throat> you know, obviously, um, you know, through lesson six, you'll you'll have read my 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 gambling issue that I went through, gambling addiction that I went through. It's a big big failure on my my part. Um, <clears throat> even though it's led to personal growth, it was a it was a huge huge failure on my on my part that um, I've never really forgiven myself for. Um, what happened there? What happened? What as in like what? Why did you start gambling and, and what was the situation? <laughs> um, I was just um, I was just completely lost in life, totally lost in terms of my direction and where I was going to go. Um, if I'm being brutally honest, it's hard to make money as a disabled person. Um, it's hard to you know. There's a lot of people out there, able bodied people out there saying that they're, they're making a lot of changes and it's all about accessibility, et cetera, et cetera. But there's so much more work that needs to be done and everybody people are thinking they're really making a change and it's really making an impact, but it's actually not. There's so much more that can be done. And so I felt like I couldn't make money in the normal conventional way. It's tough and my parents or my brother was on a, an amazing trajectory, my dad, you know, was a businessman on his own trajectory. And I was just struggling. I didn't know where I was going. All my racing had gone. I had some disposable income and I thought that that was my savior to, oh, maybe I can make some crazy, crazy money. I I never wanted to be a multi, multi-millionaire and fly around on private jets and all that sort of stuff. But I had no structure at all. And I was just completely lost and um, yeah, I found it and it put me in a hole, spiraled down, 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 downwards. Um, and I, I couldn't get out of it. Mm. Um, How did you get out of it? I got out of it when I basically hit the bottom, um, you know, <laughs> and had no other option other than to, I felt like I was in a, I was at the bottom of a well. Do you know what I mean? It's like once you get there, you look at the top and you're like, oh shoot, um, I'm really deep in here. And the first thing I did was was go to my parents, um, go to my mum. You know, my mum is, she's a huge support mechanism for me and she helped me just get some structure around my day to day. Mm-hmm. I gave her control over my finances and and just get up in the morning, have a shower, you know, put your clothes away, tidy up, you know, look after the space that you live in was, was the way forward and the way out. Um, and then, you know, as you'll read in the book, everything started to just turn, but not through me focusing on my parents and trying to get help from them. I actually found it within myself, being like, right, no, I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna work to, to find this sponsorship, to, to find this money. I, I want to race. Yeah. Um, and you know, then I found public speaking, and you know, then I was getting a lot of positivity. People being like, oh. Nick is valuable. He is someone of, of value. Um, he is worth sponsoring, or he's worth speaking in front of our corporate clients, or whatever it was. And it was because I went the opposite direction of I'm a disabled black man, pretty much, with nothing now, and I have no value. So I was stuck in a dark room, feeling like there's no point me being around. Um, <laughs> and so. To finally pull myself out, you know, was a was an, an amazing achievement. But it's a just like I write in the book, you know, it's a scar, it's a, a stain, I would say, on my personal being and a, a failure on my side. Because um, I should have known better. I feel I feel I should have known better. But when you're so lost, um, it's hard to think rationally. Mm. And you said there were two failures. Should I ask about the second? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my, my second failure was my uh, my big crash at Thruxton. Um, mm-hmm. Huge, huge, huge accident I had. Um, and, you know, I can put that down to a lack of experience. Um, um, you know, I, w- I, was, I was put in the deep end with motorsport and I was trying to learn to swim, basically. Mm-hmm. So inevitably you're going to crash at some point. Yeah. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's been an it's been a, an amazing journey, and everybody goes through life's life up and down, and and I don't think if any of this stuff that I've been talking to you today happened, the book wouldn't be sitting here. 
Mm. Um, you know, and, and and my book isn't about hey, look at me, look how amazing I am. Um, it's look, it's it's hey, look what I've been given in terms of I got given this condition, and there's loads of parents that are in the same position my parents are in, thinking, what's my son or daughter going to be like when they get to thirty? Will they be able to have relationships? Will they be able to be a part of normal society? Will they have friends? Can they get a job? Can they go out to the pub and have a laugh and have a, you know and be a part of everybody? Um, and that's the whole point: is yes, they can. Um, they can just be a normal human. Because there's a lot of my problems and troubles. It's not because I'm a disabled person. Um, so it's just because I'm human. So um, you know, my 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 dis my my book relates to disabled people and able-bodied people as well. And hopefully, you know, you you learnt something as an able-bodied person reading my book too. Yeah, definitely. And how did you find narrating the audiobook? I was really nervous because I don't feel like I read well. Um, and, you know, I've, I've read my book probably, what, six or seven times now because obviously you've got to do the editing and, and all of that. And so all the way through the editing process, I was reading it aloud um, and practicing basically. So I've been practicing for months and months and months and months and months. Um, I'm really proud of it. I think I did. I think I've, I've read it really well. Um, and it, it goes back to, you know, when you're talking about when you're a kid, I remember being a kid on the, um, I don't know, like it must've been five at reception, you know, when you're sitting on the carpet with all your mates and you're getting a story told to you. I couldn't believe like the teacher could always put like a personality into the words that she's reading. Um, and I was able to do that, you know, able to put my own personality into uh, into to, to me narrating it. And so I'm really proud of that. Um, and at the end of me recording everything, I was I said to, to the, um, the guy that was recording it, I said, I was uncomfortable when I first started reading. So can I now go back and you know, read the first chapter again yeah. because I'm in a completely different headspace. I'm so much more comfortable, um, and so so yeah, it's been great. Uh, what an amazing opportunity um, to to get. And after absolutely everything, you know, I always pinch myself and think, you know, to be a published author is. I can't believe I call myself an author, but you are you know, an author. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> um, you know, is a is is an amazing achievement, and to be um, to be actually narrating my own book. Never thought that that would ever happen. Um, you know, which is which has been incredible. So I'm super grateful. Amazing. Well Nick, this has been such a pleasure to chat to you. Oh, Thank absolutely. you so much. No worries. Thank you so much.